Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we have a program on Hughes Aircraft History. We're at the historical Culver City facility for a retiree's reception in the building where the Spruce Goose was built. We'll be interviewing some of the Hughes retirees who helped create the magic that was Hughes Aircraft. Let's go in and enjoy the event. I'm here with Ken Richardson. Ken, what were the years that you worked for Hughes Aircraft and what was your role? I arrived here in 1952 as part of the fellowship program, which was a mechanism the company used to attract people from universities. I started work as a radar design engineer, and over the years I progressed mostly due to blind luck and retired as president in 1991. Can you talk to us a little more depth about how you transitioned to a management role? Part of the learning was how to do management so my second uh, attempt at a master's degree was at uh, UCLA, having completed USC as, uh, in engineering, and I got an MBA with the idea of diversi diversifying my ability to do things. So I not only learned technical things as I grew through the company, but also management and how to deal with people. I think that's an important blend of things. So the various roles I played were in radars, guided missiles, and then of course at corporate. The most exciting thing to me that I did was, I was very fortunate to be named the group manager for missile systems. Our staff at the time doing that sort of work was about 13 to 14,000 people located in San Fernando Valley and also in Tucson, Arizona. That was exciting because a guided missile sort of does everything. It flies, it has its own propulsion system. It has its own brain. It has its own eyes. It can find what it's going for, get there, and do its job. So it's very exciting because every technology you can think of is involved in getting it to work right. What's it like to be back here at the Culver City facility? It was very exciting to see again these facilities, which are designated as a California historic site and the Ratkovich company is doing an excellent job in bringing them all back to life, all 11 buildings. It also is exciting to see some of the people that we teamed with to do the things that the company did. We were rated really as a national treasure and to see these people again who were dedicating their hearts to our mission and succeeding in creative technology is a real wonder again and it uh, makes the heart throb to come back. It's also exciting to hear some of the Hughes aircraft artifacts are being collected for a museum. I think history can be preserved in many ways. One, of course, is preserving these buildings and making them an historic site, as has been done with many other buildings around the world. Another is to find a way to store and display the artifacts. This company actually became the electronic source for aerospace. We had between 1,200 and 12,000 products, depending on how you uh, number them. We conquered every part of the electromagnetic spectrum, so there was nothing we could not do. Many of those things are world set, set world records, and we should restore those artifacts and put them on display. The Western Museum of Flight in Torrance has a plan to build a new building and display many of these artifacts. Some of, their resident, some of them are resident in uh, Raytheon Corporation. It's possible they will make a loan of these, and others are actually stored in people's homes, and those are being solicited and will be gathered. I think that's going to be a marvelous display of the artifacts of things that we created. In your book, Hughes After Howard, you captured the magic that is Hughes Aircraft. Can you talk about that? As mentioned previously, there are many ways to record history. One is by preserving the buildings, another is displaying the artifacts, and a third is to record the history in writing. With the help of 90 other people and four years of effort, this book has been created. And yes, the idea is to capture the magic of what it is that we did. There's very seldom any other way that you can do that. Could you tell us a little bit more about the environment at Hughes Aircraft that led to these major breakthroughs? 
I think we had something that was magic. It was an attitude and a devotion to trying to do something different. Some of that was inspired by Mr. Hughes because that was his reputation. But as you probably know, in 1953, he essentially disappeared. And by that time, we had gone into electronics. The difficulty of describing what we did is very, very weighty because we were comprehensive. We did everything that could be done in electronics. To, now to portray that in a book is very, very difficult. And how we did it is even more important. What management styles did we invent to assure that these people that we had would still be going in the same direction, but at the same time breaking the barriers that were perceived by other people. In other words, doing new things and inventing things. Our population grew to 85,000 people, largest employer in California, largest in Arizona, operating in 13 states and five other countries. We had 22,000 engineers and scientists, of whom 4,000 were PhDs. Where else in the world that gathering of creativity can be found? I don't think so. And so we had a unique set of people, but we had a motivation that I think surmounted many barriers. We had the advantage of private ownership, so we didn't have to satisfy our stockholders with significant things happening every six months or every three months because we could have a long-term objective. If we made some money, we could reinvest that in further research and development. Now, one more thing that's difficult to describe is that we more or less perfected the system of program management. Some of our systems are extraordinarily complex. Example, the F-14 system has a radar, an infrared system, set of controls and displays, a missile, set of power supplies, many, many complex things that require different technologies. How do you get all that to come together and function properly? About 3,000 people are required to invent it, and therefore you have to have a unique management style that will maintain that creativity and yet get the end product to function properly and to do it on time and schedule. So we did develop some unique skills in management, and I think we're very effective in our creative workforce. Could you give us some example how those breakthroughs are affecting our everyday lives today? Yes, indeed. We did become the number one military contractor in the world, rated by the entire world in that regard. We also created many marvelous things that are used by civilization today that improve our lifestyles. Let's cite a few of those. One, world, or worldwide communication through satellites. We were the ones that invented and made practical the geosynchronous satellite. And that then turned into something that now can achieve worldwide communications in an instant, fa in instant fashion. We invented the laser. Lasers are used everywhere. Medicine, production of various products, of course, it's used in entertainment and used in communication. Everybody's heard about fiber optics communication, the most rapid way to communicate any data. That uses lasers. We all know what lasers are and we enjoy them. Cell phones, there are millions of cell phones throughout the world. The signal processor in each one of those was really the product of what we did. In addition to those things, everybody now knows about Direct TV was once again using a satellite so that now you can receive 200 tel uh, television channels directly in your home using a very tiny antenna mounted on the roof. So you're directly looking at that satellite and getting that material relayed to you. I think there are now something over 22 million subscribers to that. So those are some of the things I think that civilians will have benefited from from what we did. Did you have any personal dealings with Howard Hughes? No, I did not. Even to me, he was a mystery, as, it, as he was to many other people. However, one time I was walking down the hall in one of our buildings, and there came a group of people, and this very tall man in the middle of them talking to them as they walked by. Well, that was Howard Hughes. 
at the time, I think it was 1953, he was contemplating selling the company just before he had to do so and devote us to uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So he was touring around the facilities with some of their executives. The person I did meet and get to know very well was somebody named William Lummis, Bill Lummis, Will Lummis. And he came from Houston. He was the one that settled Howard Hughes' estate. Many of you might recall that there was a very per uh, unknown will that uh, Mr. Hughes had done for an enormous empire. And there's a lot of contest over settling that. Mr. Lummis was the one that did it. Here's the story. When he first was introduced on the scene in 1976, after Mr. Hughes' death, there was a large black tie affair here locally for most aerospace leaders. I was there. We're down eating our salad, and up there was a dais with seven spaces, one of which was blank. Well, that's where Mr. Lummis was going to come. He was a prime speaker, and he was a little late. The curtain swept open just like in a museum, I mean a movie, and in he comes. The thing that was amazing, he took a stride, he looked exactly like Howard, tall and slim, and when he talked to us, he had a nice high-pitched voice just like Howard Hughes did. So it was almost like seeing a clone. When I got to know him later, I said, Will, how is it possible that you could look so much like Howard Hughes and act like him? And he says, I don't know, he's my second cousin, I only met him once. I thought that was marvelous, so I sort of knew Howard Hughes, but it was an imitation. Do you have any memories or stories you'd like to share? Well, I have a long list of stories, many of which are in the book. And by the way, those of you who do see the book will find it's not only technology and management, but a lot of good, fun stuff, a lot of people things. And there were many, many such events. I'll just cite two. One is, on the site where we are now, it was actually built on the wetlands, the Bologna Creek, uh, Creek <laughs> wetlands. And whenever it started to rain, as it's doing today, it would frequently flood because there was no drainage system. And many of us young engineers had the great glory of being sent home at noontime because likely our cars would be flooded and we would never get home. So it was kind of a nice, we had a nice time. We had a half day off for free. One time when it was really flooded, one of the employees got in a Volkswagen and drove down the exit road, came up to the next street, which is called Jefferson Boulevard, and it was a torrent. It was like a river. This person decided to try it anyway and the Volkswagen floated and it went racing down the road, went into a storm drain, was never seen again. So we always wonder what happened to that person if they ever got out, well, we never heard. Another interesting me, uh, thing to me, technically, was we did many marvelous technical things that no one else had ever done. And I mentioned the complexity of what we did. One I will cite is a program that I had a lot of my heart in, once again, the F-14 Tomcat and its Phoenix missile. The purpose of this machine was to defend the Navy, the fleet. And they would go out and do patrol craft, let's say patrol around the fleet. Upon spotting an enemy set of uh, airplanes coming in, they could do something about it. You could see these airplanes about 200 miles away. The system was allowed to, or was able to track 24 at the same time. The rear seat operator, I was one of those once by the way, could then select six of those to shoot missiles and this marvelous missile, you could shoot six of them at the same time and they would guide to separate targets that could be 25 miles apart. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. No one else had ever done that, multiple shot at long range. The thrill was to see it actually demonstrated. These tests were done off Point Magoo and we all went up there for this hallelujah event because we were going to have six drones out there, six shots, all made at the same time, and see if they're going to work. And guess what? Got five direct hits, each about 25 miles away, and one that was a near miss that would have been destroyed by the warhead. That was perfection. So here was something extremely complex, and by golly, in the test, it worked. That is a thrill. Could you talk about the H-4 or 
called the flying boat or it's also called the spruce goose. That name spruce goose was very offensive to Mr. Hughes, but nonetheless it stuck because media can advertise something that captures people's minds. Spruce goose is perfect because it was thought to be made out of spruce, which it wasn't, and it thought to be a goose because people thought it would never fly, so it kind of fit and became colorful for people to use. The machine was in, originally intended as a long-range transport vehicle to avoid the submarine wolf packs that the Germans had in the Atlantic. So in other words, we could fly massive supplies to Europe without fear of being torpedoed. Very difficult to torpedo an airplane. Nonetheless, it was extremely difficult to make because it was so large, 400,000 pounds when loaded. It was so large and the government said, make it out of non-strategic materials. So it was all made out of wood. And the wonders of it included a system called Duramold, which is little tiny uh, plywood pieces that are welded together to be stronger than steel. So the st structure was made out of that, as was the uh, outside surface. So it was a magnificent technical design. And many of you know that, of course, it did fly once, only once, and it didn't fly very far or very long, but it did fly. Its main deficiency was inadequate power. It had eight engines, and they just didn't have enough thrust to be able to handle this airplane over a long time. You may not know that it was stored in Long Beach for many, many years, kept under secret wraps, and Mr. Hughes had those engines changed two other times, trying to improve the amount of power, but there was, it was never tried again. It is now up in Oregon and could be seen at the McMinnville uh, town at a, at a museum. I'd recommend you look at it. Was private ownership helpful in winning secret contracts? Private ownership indeed was a boon to many of the things we did. And with the name Hughes in front of us, it also helped doing many things that were mysterious and clandestine. So much of the stuff we did over these years related to security or what's called special access required. We were a natural place to do that. Some of these were called black programs, some highly classified programs. There are all kinds of magic names to talk about clandestine work in which we do something extremely secret. You don't want anybody to know what you did. And of course, the reason was that we don't want the enemy to know what our capabilities will become. So yes, it did help a lot. We did win about 80% of the competitions we entered, which I think is rather remarkable. And we were in many, many highly classified programs, some of which cannot be revealed today. I'll tell you about one because I had another real fun encounter working on that program. Many of you heard about the Mach 3 reconnaissance airplane called the SR-71. By the way, it was really the RS-71, but when President Johnson announced it, he got it mixed up and he called it the SR-71, so it's been misnamed ever since. But when a president do, does it, you know, you got it here. That airplane also had an interceptor version. And the idea was that as the, um, let's call it the Cold War progressed, if a large bomber fleet came across the Atlantic at us, you could have airplanes located anywhere in the United States, these supersonic airplanes, they could get there at the border in time and shoot those airplanes down before their nuclear weapons could be delivered, so before they came on shore. I got to work on that program because we had the weapon control system, the radar, and the missile for that machine. My fun thing was I was in charge of the physical design of all the stuff that went into the airplane, the stuff that we put in, the electronics, sorry, the radar and the weapon system that went into the airplane. You had to make it very small because the space wasn't very large, so it's a difficult job. 
Here's the funny story. We made a mock-up, which is a wooden reproduction of what it is you plan to use. Then the idea was to take this and see if it fits into the airplane. The airplane was out at the famous Skunk Works in Burbank. Okay, so the question is, how do we get this wooden thing, which was, let's say, about the size of five dining room tables, how do you get it transported out there without having somebody find out about it? Here's what we did. We, I went out personally and rented a pickup, tr a large truck, moving van. I wasn't very good at driving big trucks. But anyway, I put on a disguise. We had a special system where I could get through the security gate that was way me through. And then I came below a second story of one of our buildings and there was a crane which lifted this device all wrapped up in canvas and placed it into this van. And then what I had to do was drive it up to Burbank and deliver it and see if it fit. What was the problem? Well, one of our people came up who belonged to the Transport Labor Union and said, I don't recognize you. Are you a member of the union? I said, no, I'm not. Oh my goodness, there was a big ruckus. We had to go way to the top of the labor union, I don't know where he was, probably Sacramento, to get approval to have this non-labor person <laughs> drive this truck. And I did. And the other funny part is I went up the canyon as you go over to Burbank, and this was a double shift sort of a truck. You had to downshift and hit the clutch twice. I ground the gears on that thing, and I'm not sure that it ever worked again, but it was quite an experience. And that's how you do clandestine work. You have to take disguises, you have to hide things in canvas, you have to not acknowledge who you are or what you are, and in some cases, you have to take a pledge never to tell about it the rest of your life. So it's really fun stuff. And yes, private ownership did help. And the name Hughes helped also because clandestine, mysterious, it all goes together, the same aura. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the company? The purpose of this book, of course, is to record the history of a national treasure, which will otherwise be lost. It began in 1932 under Mr. Hughes and operated for 14 years doing unusual things, mostly in the airplane business. They built four, or designed and built four different types of airplanes, some of which the largest in the world, one of which was the fastest in the world, and so forth. In 1946, something dramatically different came along. Two individuals, Dr. Simon Ramo and Dr. Dean Wooldridge, came along with the help of the government and transformed the company into electronics. We were really the original Silicon Valley because we brought electronics into aerospace. Then in 1953, as you've heard, there was a big ruckus. Those two gentlemen left, because Mr. Hughes was unable to do management properly. The Air Force came in and demanded something different happen. So we were donated to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. In 1953 then, because of all these stresses, a new management team came in. Pat Hyland, who was an excellent far-sighted manager. Alan Puckett, who had been with the company and was one of the world's best technical people. And John Richardson, I used to call him the real Richardson, who was the best marketer that we've ever found. Now there is a composite team that can make something happen. We started with zero assets in 1953, and by 1985, when the government forced the Medical Institute to sell us to General Motors, we were worth $5.2 billion. That doesn't sound like a lot today, but it certainly was at that time. And, as I think we said before, 85,000 people with all those scientists and engineers doing marvelous things. That is kind of a history of what we really did without going through all of the many products that I will be found or you can find out about in the book. So that's a brief history which should not be lost because I say it is a national treasure and we're now all gone because General Motors decided in the late 70s to dismember us and sell us in pieces. And it's very unfortunate because we've lost our name and maybe the history. So hopefully though, the building here, the artifacts we talked about earlier, 
and it's written history in the book, we'll preserve some of this for the future. Why does it need to be preserved? We think still that we were unique in terms of motivating creative skill, creative things, inventive things, breaking the boundaries. There are very few companies today that can function like that. There are a few. We've moved from the aerospace age to the information age. We went through the communication age and all us age names. The problem is, I think, that we're not inspiring our young children to become interested in science and technology. That is always the path to the future. And unfortunately, other nations are not doing that. They are seeing that that's where the future is and many of their children are eager to participate in science and engineering. We are losing those skills because that self-interest is not re-embodied in future generations. So we hope these history things that I've just mentioned will inspire people to, hey, get those kids to start thinking this way. We all need it. Thank you, Ken, for helping to make Hughes Aircraft a national treasure and preserving its history to inspire future generations. Indeed, it was a privilege. I was very, very fortunate to be able to be a part of this company. And it should not be forgotten, not just to inspire the future, but as a tribute to these people that work together so hard to make all these wonderful things happen. That is another thing that should not be forgotten, teamwork. We could not have done anything without the teamwork of so many devoted people. I'm here with Warren Matthews. And what was your role at Hughes Aircraft? And what years did you work there? Uh, I came to California in 1949 on leave of absence from Bell Telephone Laboratories, where I was involved in research work. And uh, <clears throat> I came to go to Caltech. I saw an advertisement on the bulletin board at Caltech for the Howard Hughes Doctoral Fellowship. So I invested in a postcard and I got the fellowship. I was in the second class of, of that program. Uh, I went to work immediately for the theory and analysis section of the guided missile division. It wasn't a division then, but that group. Doing uh, advanced mathematics. And uh, <clears throat> then as time went on, why I got involved in writing proposals and, and uh, I became a section head, whatever what that really meant was you got a parking place. And, uh, and, and gradually moved up and, to, up and around the company. Warren, I understand there was a breakthrough when you were involved with the missiles. Can you talk about that? I was assigned or invited to take on the problem of solving of solving analytically what the missed distance of a guided missile would be. Uh, you can prove that the trajectory of a guided, guided missile is not subject to being solved other than on digital computers. But uh, uh, I took on the trying to get a solution, uh, what we call a closed form solution, of the of the missed distance under various conditions, target maneuvering, target not maneuvering, uh, uh, various kinds of noise and so on. And uh, I indeed solved that and uh, put it into a, uh, a, doc a publication called uh, Technical Memorandum 360. And that memorandum got spread all around the defense industry and it, it was a definitive answer of the question. Warren, can you talk a little bit about Hughes culture? Well, the Hughes Aircraft Company, as we know it, the electronics company, got started at a very unique time and in the shadow of a very unique person and led to the culture of the company. Um, <clears throat> after World War II, Howard Hughes had a few buildings, uh, some equipment, a uh, few employees, but had never had a production contract in the military area. 
He hired General Aker, who was commander of the 8th Air Force in England and Europe, uh, to be a consultant to him and advise him what to do. And General Aker patted around the Pentagon and elsewhere and came back and said, Howard, electronics is a thing of the future. So uh, Howard went to Dave Evans, who was head of his radio department, and said, Dave, go, go, go. And Dave went, went, went. And between Dave and, and uh, Howard, they hired Cy Ramo, who had been the head of the GE Research Laboratories. And Cy Ramo immediately brought along his PhD classmate, Dean Woldridge, who was a VP of uh, Bell Laboratories. And they set about to build an electronics company in the middle of the, what had been a purely an, uh, an aircraft company. Uh, <clears throat> Cy and Dean uh, adopted very, very quickly uh, a, a fundamental strategy. And their strategy was to hire an almost unlimited number of highly trained PhD, et cetera, type people and build the Bell Laboratories of the West. As a matter of fact, there was a, an app apocryphal story of the Bell Labs recruiter that came out to California and got hired by Hughes. Um, Cy uh, was intimately connected with Caltech and recruited a lot of people at the Caltech campus. Uh, Woldridge had a wide variety of connections in the research area himself. And so that's the kind of people that they naturally drew on now. At the end of World War II, there were a whole bunch of technologies that were evidently going to be in, 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 important in the um, military business, but that were still almost still in the research area. The uh, uh, radar, the guided missile, the jet aircraft, uh, the transistor was invented in 1949, just a, right around that time. So there's a whole bunch of technologies that needed to be developed. But uh, as I say, we're still pretty much in their search area. And so this concept of developing the Bell Labs of the West was aimed at, at uh, realizing the fruits of that approach. Now, we had the invaluable uh, environment of Howard Hughes, who liked to do big things, liked to see big things done, and had limitless amounts of money. So Cy and Dean, in building up the early Hughes Aircraft Company, were able to do anything they wanted to with almost limitless capital supporting them, and no need to worry about making profit. Just, just go do it. And that led to the development of a company whose personality was that of a research laboratories. Now, very early on, the company formed a radar division and a missile division and a research laboratories, which eventually moved up to Malibu. But even though we had a research labs as a part of the company, the personality of the company was always that of a research lab. And uh, this led to a, 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 uh, a result of the personality that the Hughes Aircraft Company concentrated on doing difficult things, things that only they, if even they, could do. And the necessity to make profit was essentially non-existent. Now, we, we did indeed have to make a profit to stay alive. But unlike all the rest of industry, profit was not the, the primary motivation. The primary motivation was solving extremely difficult technical problems. And 
and that's been the personality of the company ever since. Can you tell us how you move from a technical position to a management position? Yes, I would be delighted to. Um, <clears throat> I talked about the, the work I did on the, the mathematical problem of missile misdistance, missile misdistance. And I also, uh, being a generally interested guy, got involved in uh, things like defining uh, units that everybody should use so we talk the same language and gradually moved more and more into uh, the, the, you might say, real world type problems. The general view in the business world is that if you're successful, you must be promoted. And being promoted means being moved into management. Whether you have any talent for management or not, or want to or not, the assumption on the part of the, ma of the existing management is that you're good, you gotta be promoted. So I got promoted into a, a relatively low level management position. One day one of my fellows came into my office and he saw my bookcase with all the books that I had from Caltech, highly technical. And he sat down in front of that bookcase for a long time and said, boy, I sure wish I was still doing that kind of thing. And that caused me to wonder, why didn't I have that feeling also? And what I realized as a sort of a, uh, an epiphany was that the definition of me is not scientist. The definition of me is puzzle solver. And if the puzzles involve people instead of things, that simply makes them more complicated and more interesting. It, it makes them less definitive, but it's no, no less a puzzle to be solved. So I didn't, I didn't uh, push back. I didn't uh, resist moving into management. Well, I, uh, let's see, I think I, oh yeah, I know where, where the problem happened. Uh, I was uh, somewhere in the organization, I don't know quite where, and, Pat, and after Pat Hyland came, uh, he was faced with a, a, a naughty little problem of, uh, of uh, how to handle requests for proposal in the infrared area. We had a fairly large infrared department that was designing missiles for the guided, or designing infrared heads for the guided missiles. We also had a subsidiary up in Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara Research Center, that was building, uh, designing and building uh, infrared components, but also getting into the systems business also. And so every time a request for proposal came in, the question was, do you give it to Bill Craven or do you give it to the Santa Barbara Research Center? And they both wanted to bid on it. And this was a naughty little nuisance for Pat Island. And uh, I guess at the time I was working for, for uh, the VP of engineering. And they asked me to solve that problem. And the way they did it was to make me manager of the infrared laboratories, plural. And one of the labs was Craven's, one of the labs was, was uh, the Santa Barbara Research Center lab. Uh, neither of those organizations reported administratively to me, but nonetheless, I was told I was running the show and I was the only one that could fire people and all that kind of stuff. Well, I solved that problem in about four or five weeks simply by going up to Santa Barbara and spending a fair amount of time uh, getting to know the people, arranging a dinner at a place halfway between the two and inviting the managers of both and their wives and having a good time, and eventually found a, a, a practical solution in terms of of product line definition for the two organizations. So the problem went away and Hughes continued to become a major infrared power. Well, 
I went from there to, uh, I guess, I guess the next thing happened was that Pat Highland found that the property in Canoga Park was going to become available. And uh, so he got his permission to, to buy it. And then there was the question, okay, what do we put up there? I went to my then boss and said, hey, I'd like to have the job of forming a, the missile division up there. There had been a missile division back sometime earlier. And then in the course of general competition, the missile division and the radar division got more or less melded into, a, uh, into an equipment engineering division. And then there was a separate systems division that Lynn Gross had. And uh, so I volunteered to put the missile division back together again because it looked like there was going to be enough business that needed to happen. And I thought that would be a useful way to use the Canoga, Canoga Park property. They let me do it. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, uh, I'm not quite sure what happened next. Uh, somewhere along the line, the, <clears throat> the um, equipment engineering divisions got broken into two or three pieces, and I contributed to the what would be a logical definition of that. And uh, so there was a, a radar group formed, and there was a ground systems group already by that time, and a uh, uh, electro-optical data systems group. And uh, <coughs> I felt that the best person to run the electrical and data pistons group was Ed Meyer. He had experience in manufacturing that I didn't and so on. And uh, I was made assistant group executive under him. But uh, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I talked too much. Instead of letting my new boss uh, be the boss. And so I got ejected out of that position. And at that point went on corporate staff. I was made uh, uh, director of, uh, I guess it was director of engineering, I'm not sure, director of product effectiveness. Titles didn't make much difference. And uh, from then on, I was a part of the corporate structure. And if I go back to my statement that, uh, that I see myself as a puzzle solver, not as a uh, physicist or an engineer even. Uh, another thing that was clear to me was that my value to the company, my value in life, could be in solving problems in essentially a staff manner, advising line management. And so I had a two or three different positions, one of which brought me what's called a staff vice presidency, uh, with which I retired. But uh, the, the big contributions I made were mostly in terms of figuring out what should be done, how it might be done, and advising somebody else on how to do it. Did you have any interactions with Howard Hughes personally? Not what you would call an interaction. I saw him three or four times. Uh, I never actually spoke with him, uh, and uh, he didn't come around the aircraft company much after, uh, oh, I don't know, 53 or thereabouts. So, as I say, I saw him a few times, but uh, didn't, and I wasn't alone. Uh, Pat Hyland, as <laughs> general manager, said that there was a period of five years during which he had zero personal contact with Howard Hughes by telephone, by uh, fax, by carrier pigeon, any other way. He 
had no connection with the guy. Pat, uh, uh, Howard had given Pat really just three instructions. You can't change the name of the company. You can't buy real estate without my approval. And everything is painted green and it's gonna stay green. You can't change the color. And from there on, uh, it was up to Pat. Going back to the question of personality of the company, that left us in the position of a bunch of technical people running the company for our own enjoyment, whatever we consider that to be, and with limitless capital behind us. Can you talk a little bit about the bunkers here on the Hughes property? Since we were in the missile business, we needed a way to test missile pr uh, propulsion, and not, not blowing them up, but test propulsion and so on. And the bunkers were built to be able to do that. Later on in time, when we got involved in the design of high-power lasers, lasers designed for uh, military destruction, the bunker was used as a way of testing that, putting targets down at the end and shooting laser beams down. I have at home a plastic, uh, a square of plastic that was melted by the laser in one of the early tests. Are there any stories you'd like to share or favorite memories? There was a time when um, there was going to be a total eclipse of the moon that could be seen from Culver City. And uh, in line with the research attitude of the company, the guys decided to take one of their infrared cameras up on the roof and see what they could learn uh, from that uh, eclipse. Well, the, the field of view of that camera was about one-sixth or one-eighth of the diameter of the moon as seen from that location. And so they turned the camera on and watched the progression of the eclipse as it started, went to full, and, uh, and escaped. And they, what they observed, with infrared, you can determine the temperature of the thing you're looking at. And they observed that the temperature as the moon entered uh, full, dropped rather rapidly. Then during the time it was in full, it dropped more, but more slowly, and then came up rapidly at the end. And they could interpret that as meaning that the moon had a, a, uh, a, a soft, uh, uh, dirt-like surface, so that when the sunlight went off, there was an immediate drop, but then later on, because of the insulation of that surface, the drop was more slow, and they were able to predict rather accurately what the depth of the dust was on the moon. It had nothing to do with their job at Hughes, it was just fun. <laughs> One other thing I'll comment on. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention made the uh, Hughes Aircraft Company what it was in the early days was that the government had no in-house in uh, experience in this range of technologies and so on. So they needed to use not only because we could do things, but they needed us to tell them what they needed to get done. Well, that was fine for about 10 or 15 years. But the government couldn't tolerate living forever, not in control of what, what they were doing. And they built up laboratories uh, and witnessed NASA, for example. Uh, and as they built up laboratories, they also built up a major ability to manage their subcontractors. And so whereas in the early days, we had the the very enjoyable position of being partners with the Air Force in figuring out what needed to be done and how to do it. And it gradually morphed over into where the Air Force got tougher and tougher on us. Not that, as far as I'm concerned, we really needed it, but from a political point of view, they had to appear tougher and tougher on their contractors. And so working in the military business 
became less fun than it had been. Now, I was Hughes's uh, principal representative on a couple of industry associations, and I had close association with the government uh, uh, activities and relationships. And uh, I experienced very strongly this, this change from a, from a fun and therefore productive relationship to a combative one. Were you involved with the H-4 Hercules, otherwise known as the Flying Boat and Spruce Goose? No, I was not involved with either one. Uh, but of course I was aware of them because they were happening right at this property. Remember that, well, not remember, I didn't tell you. Uh, when Howard and Dave Evans set out to build an electronics company, and they hired Cy and Dean. Uh, I guess it was in 1954 that Cy and Dean recognized that Howard was never going to take the company public. And therefore, the best they could hope for was nice big salaries, but no uh, equity participation. So they left the company. Uh, formed their own little Raymo Woldridge Corporation in the back of a barber shop in Westchester, got financial backing from Thompson Products, and that led to TRW, uh, which went on to do other big things. Now, when they left, there was a real possibility, the Air Force thought there was a real possibility that the company would collapse because it had been built so strongly on the personality of those two men. And so they were worried. But being military, they know how to fight battles. And so they issued a, a, an, a, an, a, uh, uh, I can't think of the word, but anyway, they, they came to Howard and said, Howard, we'll leave our contracts with you on the condition that you somehow separate this electronics business from your personal interests, that you separate it from your own pocketbook. Howard, being a brilliant guy, knew that the Air Force had a very weak position to stand on, but that didn't bother. He came up with a very neat answer. He formed the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, a nonprofit trust. He donated the electronics portion of the company to the nonprofit trust. That provided the installation that the Air Force wanted and solved that problem. And he also, uh, because it was because the electronics part had achieved such a uh, an intimate relationship with the words Hughes Aircraft Company. He let the word Hughes Aircraft Company go with the electronics part. So the electronics part didn't and never had any involvement with airplanes. We built stuff for airplanes, but we weren't in the airplane business. He renamed the aircraft business Summa Corporation. And so when you ask my involvement in, in the H-4 and the, and the uh, Spruce Goose, none, because it was a different company. On the other hand, uh, because of the association with Hughes and the fact it was all taking place at this location, uh, I certainly had plenty of, of, of recognition and involvement of them. Uh, we could hear the, the, the helicopter thump, thump, thump as the thing went around with a very slow bit. So I had a lot of interest but no involvement. You ask about my uh, reaction to the name Spruce Goose. Uh, I think it's uh, neat from an advertising point of view. Hughes hated it, but uh, so what? <laughs> Could you share with us how the organization developed? Yeah, well, the, <clears throat> with the uh, high density of, of senior, of, of, of highly capable technical people. 
the organization developed not so much top down as simply a basis for implementing things that got invented. Uh, <clears throat> the initial focus of the company was uh, guided missiles and the uh, fire control systems for them in uh, military aircraft and fighter aircraft. But um, one of the things that the radars needed was a particular kind of semiconductor known as the Goldbond diode. And we had a, such a spectrum, total spectrum of technical competence, anything we needed, but the company endeavored to do. And um, so the company developed the diodes that the radar needed, and that led to the formation of a semiconductor division. Uh, in the, um, I think it was in the research labs, Nick Begovich was working on frequency scan radar, scanning the radar by frequency change as opposed to physically rotating the antenna. And uh, <clears throat> that proceeded well and led to the formation of the ground systems group. So the, and, oh, and, and uh, Harold Rosen was working in the radar division or whatever it was called at the time. And he and uh, Don Williams, who worked for me, got the idea of uh, a synchronous satellite, a satellite at a, an altitude such that its rotation around the Earth would be exactly 24 hours. And uh, <clears throat> they were working over in a corner of the radar organization, um, and they concluded that they had enough, uh, enough going here that the company really ought to back it. And uh, that was the formation of the space systems. So the, the point I'm making is that the, that the structural development of the company followed the sequence of major inventions and, and technical improvements made by people in the company. And we had a total spectrum of capability so that anything you wanted, you could find in the company. Now that we weren't unwilling to buy from the outside, we just didn't have to. Thank you for joining Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.